This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. Business owners need to think about how to build an ethical and compliant culture. Every business, every group of people has a, a culture to it, whether it's spelled out specifically or whether it's just something that's apparent from the way the people act with each other. And as a business owner, you should be aware that when you're selecting employees, training and supervising and communicating with them, you're affecting whether you're building a culture that is ethical and compliant or a culture that might be more inclined to take shortcuts. First thing to do is to think about what kind of culture you want to build with your business. Are you trying to build a chiropractic practice that's oriented to serving patients? going to be professional, based on honesty, or one that's based just on only trying to make money. If you're trying to build a culture that's based only on trying to make money, patients are going to figure that out pretty quick, and they're probably not going to be inclined to use your, use your business. So think about what kind of values are important to you personally, and what kind of values you want to emphasize to your employees. Once you've decided what kind of culture you want to create, you can think about how you want to communicate that culture to your employees. You want to reinforce that culture or those values when you're training your employees, when you're socializing new employees, introducing them to other employees and, and, and engaging them in social events like lunch. You want to reemphasize that culture when you're doing appraisals. Nobody likes doing job reviews. Every manager I've ever worked with did not like doing job reviews. But that's also a very important part of what managers do and a very important way to communicate to employees. Reward them when their behavior is consistent with the culture and make sure they're aware when their behavior is inconsistent or conflicts with the culture. Uh, and of course, disciplining of, of employees when an employee is being disciplined, it, it is important to show how their conduct is in conflict with the culture that you're trying to build. And that helps them understand the importance of not making that same mistake again. It all starts with selecting employees. I like uh, Paul Getty's uh, uh, statement, the employer generally gets the employees he deserves. I think some business owners, especially new business owners, think the employees will just happen to be the right employees, and they don't put much thought into, into the process of selecting employees, and as a result, they pretty consistently get bad employees. So let's talk about how that you select employees. The starting point is always a job description. Before you advertise, Put together a job description. What do you expect this employee to do? What skills are they going to need? What level of uh, uh, education is required? What other job experience might be necessary or helpful? But start with that job description on a day-to-day -day basis and on an overall basis. What kind of work do you expect them to be doing? There's a difference between the kind of employee you might select who's going to be a front desk receptionist who's somebody who has to turn the lights on and off in the morning and in the evening, someone who has to water the plants, as opposed to somebody who's going to be a chiropractic assistant or somebody who's going to be an associate doctor. So always start with that job description. Think to yourself or ask yourself, why would anyone want to work in your office? Why is your office an attractive place to work? And how will you know that you are looking or interviewing the right person? And what work are you going to do to help that person succeed once you select them for the job? Think those questions through before, you, again, before you advertise, uh, before you start interviewing employees. Use a job application or a resume. Ask the employee to provide some information about themselves so that you can conduct an appropriate background check. Spend time interviewing employees. Be thorough, be careful, be thoughtful, and be willing to say no. It is much easier to interview an employee and tell them they didn't get the job 
than it is to interview it or hire an employee and after 30 days or 90 days tell them that they are losing the job. So it's much easier to handle this bad news through the interview or at the time of the interview rather than after you've hired the employee. Before you hire somebody, check the references. Now, many times when you check employment references, you will get basically no information. They will confirm that the employee worked there and uh, uh, what their job title was, and that's usually about it. But sometimes you, when you check references, you will find somebody who will tell you a lot of other information that may help you understand whether this is a good choice or not for your business. If you're hiring into a job that requires a license, take the time to check the license and verify that it's in good standing and not subject to any disciplinary action. And the bottom line is when in doubt, don't hire. The impression the interviewee or the applicant makes is never going to be better than during the job interview. It's a mistake to think that the employee had a bad day on the job interview and maybe it'll be better after they've worked in your office for a week or two. It won't be. It'll get worse. So if you have any doubt about whether this is the right person, don't hire them. Talk for a minute about the interview process. Most important part of the interview is to listen. This is not about you selling the job to the employee. The interview is about you learning about the employee, learning about their character, their personality, and whether they will be a good fit for the culture that you are trying to create in your office. I think it's appropriate to take notes during an interview, but be careful about what you write down and make sure you write down things that are not going to get you into trouble later. Um, don't write down things that might indicate that you're going to be discriminatory. Try to ask applicants the same questions. Now, I don't mean that you should follow a script, but you should cover essentially the same topics with every applicant and about the same level of depth with every applicant. Otherwise, it may appear that you're being discriminatory towards some applicants, and that may be could be a legal problem. Hire employees to fit the culture. You may find an applicant who is extremely well qualified and could do the job exceptionally well. But if they're not going to fit the culture that you're trying to create or creating in your office, then that's probably not somebody who's going to be successful in the long term in your office. So don't hire them. Wait until you find the right fit. That preparing for interviews is critical. One of the things that happens when somebody is looking for a job, they'll often go on a number of interviews in fairly short order. They may go on 10, 15, 20 interviews. So the applicant has a lot of experience showing up for interviews and they figure out pretty quickly what answers work and what answers don't work. So it's important for you as the business owner who may only do three or four interviews to take the time to prepare for them so that you can offset that additional experience the applicant may have with the interview process. I also think it's important to think about the questions you're going to ask during the interview. Now, I'm not putting this list out here as these are the best questions to ask or the only questions to ask, but think about what you're going to ask. It, it's, it's not very helpful usually to ask open-ended or, or generic questions like tell me about yourself. You want to ask questions that are going to help you learn a little bit more about this applicant. So one that, that I've used in the past is to ask what was your first job? Now, it's not that I really care what the person's first job was, but it's the follow-up question. What values did you learn on that job? So maybe the first job was flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. What values did they learn? They learned the importance of teamwork. They learned the importance of communication with their team members. They learned the importance of keeping their workspace clean and clutter-free. Uh, what are some other things they may have learned? 
And obviously you don't want to tell them what they learned. You want to ask them what values they learned. I think this one's also good. Rate your skill if there's something in particular you're asking about. Rate your skill on a scale of 1 to 10. And most people are not going to rate themselves a 10. They're going to figure they need to be humble and at least give themselves an 8 or a 9. And the follow-up question is, why did you rate yourself that way? And what would it take to raise your level to a 10? That's going to tell you more about the weaknesses that person may have. Uh, think about the workplace interaction and policies. Uh, if you are particularly concerned about attendance, then it's always a good question to ask the applicant, what do you think is a fair attendance policy? Now, if the person wants the job, they're almost always going to come back with a very strict policy. You know, maybe miss five days a year or, or three days a year, uh, which gives you the opportunity to come back and explain how your policy is much more lenient than that. Uh, it's almost never going to be the situation that they come back and say you ought to be able to miss one day a week or 20% of the work days. But the benefit of asking this question is you help set the tone for the employment. You help the employee understand that this policy is important to you. If it's going to be a problem, they can evaluate it before they accept the job. And if it becomes a problem after you hire somebody, you can refer back to this interview question when you're disciplining them so that they understand that this is an important policy. And if they're not going to follow the policy, they're going to lose the job. Now, there's all kinds of resources, you know, books and, and Internet resources out there to help you identify some good interview questions. The, these, again, I put out there just as an example or a few examples for you. And, and the key is to prepare for the interview and not just show up and carry it on like a casual conversation. Have the have an idea about the topics and the questions you want to cover and use the questions in a way that helps you learn as much as you can about the applicant. And of course, applicants are protecting themselves. They're going to be restricted and or, or careful about what they tell you. You need to try to probe beyond the obvious answers. You also need to be careful about some topics that can get you into trouble. I assume you know already that you can't discriminate on the basis of, cer of certain things. And the idea behind these lists of topics you probably don't want to ask about is, is if you don't know about the reason to discriminate against somebody, you can't be discriminating against them on that basis. Now, certainly that's not going to be perfect, but sometimes that can be a pretty effective way to defend these cases. So before you get into any of these topics, you want to think about whether the topic is relevant to the job. Is it going to help you select the right employee? And is this a factor that the applicant can improve or control? If it's beyond their control, like the applicant's race, then it's probably not something you should be discriminating against them on. Uh, first one is age. Generally, you shouldn't be asking the applicant's age. It is appropriate to ask whether they're at least 18 years old so that you know or can confirm that they're old enough to be working in your office. Uh, there's a difference between an arrest record and a conviction record. Even though someone has been arrested for an offense, that doesn't mean that they've been convicted. We have a presumption that they're innocent until proven guilty. So there are a number of states that will prohibit discrimination based on an arrest record. Asking about the employee's attendance record in a previous job can be a risky topic. If the employee had an attendance problem, it might have been due to a disability, and that's going to make you aware of that disability, which you may not have known about otherwise. So rather than asking about attendance at a previous job, uh, Explain what your policy is on attendance or missed work or sick days and ask the employee whether that will be a problem. Uh, working on weekends can be a disguised way to try to find out what religion the employee belongs to 
or whether the person is active in their religion. Uh, the better practice is to specify your work hours. If your ordinary work week is Monday through Saturday within certain hours, set those hours out and ask the applicant, can they work during the hours? Uh, where was the person born is probably not going to be helpful, but it could help you identify whether their national origin is someplace other than the United States um, and make it possible for you to, disc to discriminate on that basis. Uh, credit history might be appropriate for a few jobs, but for most jobs it's not necessary and not appropriate. You shouldn't ask applicants whether they have any disabilities. Focus on the job. Focus on here's what the skills are, what the duties of the job are. Do you have those skills? Can you perform those duties? If the applicant tells you they can't or that they need some kind of accommodation, then you might follow up with a discussion about what accommodations they need and, and whether those accommodations are reasonable. So you get the general idea, hopefully, on these general topics. Um, some, some of them you may not be able to avoid. Some of them may be obvious, you know, like the person's race or sex. But if it's something that you don't need to ask about, you don't need to emphasize it by asking the question, you don't want to do it. The idea is you want to hire the best possible employee. And these factors, even though they may seem appealing to you, probably are not going to help you identify the best possible employee. So what do you do when employees make mistakes? Mistakes are going to happen. That's the way people grow and that's the way they move forward. When mistakes happen, even before mistakes happen, you want to provide training for the employee. If you've seen employees making mistakes, reevaluate the training that you provided. Maybe you should have provided a different kind of training for the employee to help them perform the job to the, the best possible way. Uh, when employees do break the rules, whenever possible, use progressive discipline. Now, it depends on the seriousness of the violation. If a employee commits sexual misconduct with a patient, you probably have a pretty immediate dismissal. If an employee is stealing money from the practice, you probably have a pretty immediate dismissal. But if an employee has shown up late a couple days, then you probably want to follow this progressive discipline. Part of the reason you do that is it's out of fairness to the employee. It helps communicate that you're trying to be fair to them. It also helps you avoid the cost of replacing the employee. You know, it's, it's a mistake to think employees are fungible, easily interchangeable items. They aren't. It takes time to advertise, review resumes, and interview applicants. That's an expense you can avoid if you can take your current employees and train them through discipline so that they don't make the same mistake again. So look at discipline not as a, a way to punish employees, but as a way to teach them. Of course, there's a big difference. If you fire somebody, you, you run a risk of a discrimination or wrongful termination claim, a lawsuit. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't have that problem if you use progressive discipline. By the way, by progressive discipline, I mean you don't fire somebody immediately. You start off with a warning. Uh, if the warning doesn't get the desired response, perhaps a suspension or perhaps a termination but you follow a two or three step process so the employee knows there's a problem, they have an opportunity to correct their behavior, and if they fail to correct their behavior, then you take the appropriate action. Now, the exception to that is if you hire an employee and it's very clear shortly after they're hired that they don't fit the culture. You probably want to get that person out of the office fairly quickly. Handling employees, leading employees, training employees, selecting employees is not something that is instinctive. It takes some thought, takes some preparation, it takes some effort and some work on the part of the business owner. But if the business owner puts in that effort, the rewards can be remarkable. 
Having good employees can help a business develop and grow much faster than if you don't have employees or if you have employees who are poorly supervised. So take the time, make the effort, and start by thinking about the culture you want to create in your practice.